Hi, everyone. Welcome to Kia's lecture series. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Rajesh Gopakumar. Professor Rajesh Gopakumar is now a director of ICTS in India. As you know well, he is not only a great physicist, but also an awesome lecturer. From today, he will give us three lectures on the driving ADS3 CFD2 correspondent. Please uh, uh, join me in welcoming our speaker, Rajesh Gopakumar. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Jungi, and uh, for the invitation to uh, uh, to speak at Kias. I wish it could have been in uh, uh, person, and uh, uh, I have had many nice visits to Kias in the past. Uh, I think the last time was probably two summers ago uh, in 2019. Uh, but um, uh, anyhow, I think it's uh, nice that at least. Uh, I can uh, talk to you on this uh, virtual format. As I said I, in my abstract, I, I will try to give an introduction to uh, uh, to this um, uh, program that uh, uh, I have been developing with um, uh, um, Matthias Gabadiel, Lawrence Everhart, uh, Andrea Day, um, Bob Knighton, uh, uh, Pranabesh Maiti, and others. Uh, so m most of the uh, what I will be saying today will be based on the papers that I have listed over here, and I will give additional uh, references uh, as we go along. Uh, so my aim and uh, Jungi uh, had asked me to start from sort of uh, scratch uh, in some sense uh, you know, from the ADS3 uh, or the classic works of Malvasena and Oguri, etc. So uh, I will try to make it as accessible, but uh, uh, and uh, so I will be actually doing it more in a blackboard style on the iPad. Uh, let's see how well that works. Um, uh, but please stop me anytime you have any uh, questions or clarifications. Uh, I'll be happy to sort of uh, answer questions throughout. And, uh, and so, yeah. So uh, as I said, uh, the, the, the title of the lectures is on deriving the ADS3 CFT2 correspondence. Um, the rough outline is as follows. I will very uh, briefly uh, uh, make an introduction as to the, uh, which will be serve as motivation uh, to what we are doing, which is essentially to understand ADS CFT around a limit, which is uh, perhaps a little less familiar to many people, the so-called tensionless limit. Uh, uh, of the string theory. Uh, and uh, I believe this is the limit around which one can actually try to derive the correspondence in the sense of uh, making the uh, uh, equality between the antidecitor space description, the string theory on antidecitor space uh, description uh, to the dual space time CFT. Uh, I think this is a, a program uh, which is actually very. Uh, uh, almost two decades old, uh, but uh, we will focus in these lectures on the specific case of ADS3 and the two, dual two-dimensional CFT and in a very special limit, which will in some ways be the starting point of such a derivation. Uh, so this will be the case of the string theory with pure NSNS flux. Uh, and this is a very nice tractable example of the ADS CFT where one can uh, have a first principle stringy description. Uh, and uh, so I will, uh, I will review some of that and um, um, uh, also mention some of the salient facts about the symmetric product or the full. Mm, uh, but we'll mostly be approaching things from the string theory side. So I will talk about uh, what in this tensionless limit looks like uh, for this particular example. Uh, it will turn out to be related to a sort of a very a solvable Vesumino-Witten model, uh, which actually has a free field realization, uh, uh, which in many ways is very suggestive of a sort of a twistorial uh, description. Uh, and um, though I will not be talking in these lectures this week about this, but uh, I believe on Monday I will be giving the uh, spring seminar at Kias on uh, the more recent work where we generalize this to ADS five times 
uh, S5 um, and the dual CFT again in the tensionless limit where this generalization will play a major role. So in some ways, this will also set the stage for the seminar uh, next week. And so uh, having set up the world sheet theory, I will uh, talk about how the spectrum on both sides matches. Um, uh, and this is a match of the full spectrum of the uh, perturbative spectrum of the string theory with the single particle states of the uh, uh, dual CFT2. Um, uh, so that was the first main piece of evidence and showing how the two sides are actually equivalent, uh, not just beyond, not just in some BPS sector, but the whole theory. Um, uh, and of course, uh, once you have a matching of the spectrum, you can ask about the more non-trivial dictionary between the two sides, namely that of correlation functions. And um, I, I will uh, describe a little bit how the correlation functions can be also matched in some manifest way uh, on both sides. Um, I will you know, probably not have much time to talk about this part, which is going from the other way around where we also see how it ties up with certain uh, earlier ideas on um, going from free fields to uh, string theories. Uh, and uh, also, uh, Jungi had requested um, something about the black holes in these theories. Uh, and I will say, uh, I will try um, uh, again, assuming time is there, uh, to talk about black holes in this tensionless limit. This uh, is actually work um, that uh, Lawrence Eberhardt and others have been uh, uh, carrying out in recent uh, uh, in recent times in this particular ADS3 CFT2. Okay, so that's sort of the rough outline of the lectures. So let me motivate um, the question of uh, an ADS CFT in a tensionless limit. So this is a diagram I like to draw to kind of illustrate the parameter space of uh, ADS CFT. Uh, and in some sense, uh, uh, shift attention to a different lamppost. Uh, so let me explain what the axes are. So the horizontal axis is the Yang-Mills coupling, uh, which is, uh, I will use Yang-Mills coupling as a sort of a stand-in for any marginal deformation. Um, um, uh, for instance, in the CFT2 example, it, it's not the Yang-Mills theory as such, uh, but there will be a corresponding marginal deformation. Mm, um, uh, so, mm, so we have the horizontal axis. You can either parameterize in terms of the Yang-Mills coupling, mm, uh, which is equivalent to um, the radius of the ADS uh, to some positive power. Yeah. And the uh, vertical axis, you can, if you're in thinking in gauge theory terms, you can think of it as one over n, or you can think of uh, so um, uh, the uh, G string, they are related, they're proportional uh, from the string theory point of view. So this is sort of the dictionary between parameters we have in the ADS side, lambda and n are the parameters in the gauge theory, the radius of ADS and the mm, string coupling are the parameters in the string theory. And uh, these two are related and these two are related. Uh, in, um, so that's the parameter space. Uh, but um, most of the time, and in these lectures, we will focus on a very small corner of the parameter space. Um, so firstly, we will work in the regime of perturbative string theory or equivalently planar uh, Yang-Mills, the large n uh, Toft limit of the planar Yang-Mills uh, side. So that essentially tells us that we are in this uh, in this corner of the diagram. And so n is equal to infinity, essentially. Uh, but even there, um, uh, we often specialize, um, even in the planar limit or the perturbative string limit, uh, we um, uh, usually spe uh, specialize. Uh, and most often, the discussion is around this part of the uh, uh, around this lamppost, so to say, uh, uh, where uh, the uh, ADS radius 
becomes very large or the curvature becomes very small. Uh, yeah, and this corresponds to strongly coupled gauge theories, the lambda goes to infinity. But the advantage of having um, the radius becoming very large is that you can apply classical gravity or supergravity and with alpha prime corrections uh, systematically included. So that's why one kind of focuses often on this corner. And this is sort of the alpha prime goes to zero limit of string theory, where it's where you can describe it by gravity together with the stringy corrections included as alpha prime corrections. So that's uh, the corner which I will not be talking about. Now I want to focus attention on this corner, uh, which is um, uh, from the point of view of the gauge theory, it is where the uh, uh, um, uh, coupling is going to zero, uh, which means uh, by this dictionary, it means that the radius of ADS in string units, uh, so LS is the string length scale in, in string units is going to zero, uh, or equivalently, you can say alpha prime is going to infinity, but this is the more accurate statement uh, because there's a dimension less number, uh, but you can loosely think of it as alpha prime going to infinity, which is why this is often referred to as a tension less limit. Uh, uh, so the string tension is very uh, uh, small compared to the, uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, to the, uh, the scale of the curvature of the ADS. So you say sometimes this is highly stringy and so on. And so what I want to claim is that to understand the equivalence between the CFT and the d-dimensional CFT and the d plus one dimensional string theory or gravity theory on ADS, it's fruitful to look at this corner, to start from here. Uh, so it, you have to, of course, start from somewhere. Uh, uh, this side is, of course, very interesting, and we have learned a lot in over two decades about mm, uh, strongly coupled gauge theories um, uh, by looking at purely gravitational uh, results on supergravity, et cetera. Uh, so that's, of course, been uh, quite remarkable. But if you want to understand how exactly the CFT is dual to the string theory to be able to derive it. And why is the derivation so important? Um, because then you can hope to generalize it to other cases where you do not have some brain construction or some other mm, top-down way of uh, arriving at such dualities. Because we do believe that the scope of gauge string dualities is very extensive. And uh, so uh, to really understand how extensive it is, to, uh, to know what is the dual string theory and how exactly the gauge theory reassembles itself into a string theory. These questions can only be addressed if you try to, if you have a way of uh, deriving the duality from starting from one side, going to the other side uh, and making the connection manifest. Otherwise it becomes, remains a black box or like a miracle that we don't understand. And so this is the, uh, the driving motivation behind uh, these works. And I want to claim that this is the right limit in which to start um, um, making, understanding this equivalence. So, uh, so to be able to prove this equivalence, we need to, uh, we, it, we will uh, work starting with this corner. So why, of course, um, uh, uh, Firstly, the CFT is weakly coupled, and we all understand perturbative uh, quantum field theories in the vicinity of a, a free field fixed point. And so that is uh, something which is well under control. Of course, uh, the downside is that the string theory, as I said, is on a highly curved ADS. Um, the radius of curvature is very large. The curvature is very large compared to the string scales, um, um, but and that's why, as I said, it's tensionless. But as I will try to make uh, uh, clear in these lectures, that doesn't mean that it is out of reach. Um, it's highly curved, but it's a world sheet sigma model. Uh, it is just on a highly curved target space. So our classical intuition of gravity uh, is not always accurate. We have to think in different terms, and we will see some of that in this lecture and in my seminar next week. Um, that uh, we uh, we need to uh, we need to develop this new intuition for uh, tensionless strings and um, their dynamics. And but it is not out of analytical reach, as I will try to 
um, this thing. And in fact, we'll see that the dual string theory in the appropriate coordinates or the appropriate fields is actually still also a free theory. So not only is the CFT weakly coupled, but in some sense in a appropriate dual description, the world sheet sigma model is also a free, what I call the historical sigma model in my previous transparency. Uh, so this is the reason to, uh, uh, you know, to work with this uh, limit. And as I said, we will always keep this small G string. So we'll always be sort of here. And so we are in the perturbative regime as far as string theory goes. So I will, and except if I get down to talking about black holes and so on, I will not be really, um, uh, I will not be really uh, talking about non-perturbative phenomena. Okay, so any questions at this stage? Um, uh, otherwise I'll start. Uh, uh, on the, uh, this thing is proper. Okay, so so let's see how. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's hope this works well. Um, so we'll, as I said, focus on a particular case of ADS three and CFT two. So a canonical example. Uh, of ADS CFT is the. Uh, is that of uh, the D1, D5 system, D brain system. So this was already there in the original paper uh, uh, of um, Maldacena in 1997. Um, so uh, just let me remind you about that. Uh, so just like uh, the ADS5 CFT, uh, for the duality uh, was obtained by looking at the near horizon geometry of D3 brains in a flat space, uh, which uh, in the near horizon geometry turns out to be the ADS5 times S5, and uh, use the open string description in terms of uh, Yang-Mills theory to arrive at this duality. And, and the uh, D1, D5 brain system is sort of similar. It's near horizon geometry. Uh, is uh, ADS three times S three times M. So, and uh, we will consider the case of maximal supersymmetry. And so, M will be either T four or K three. Actually, I'll mostly focus on T four. So this original system that we are starting with, um, and the original system that we are starting with is uh, uh, one in which you have uh, D1 brains and uh, D5 brains uh, with uh, the D5 brains, uh, four directions wrapped on this M uh, and uh, uh, the D1 brains and the remaining one plus one direction, uh, directions of the D5 brain being in the remaining R6. Uh, so, uh, and that uh, the near horizon geometry of that R6 becomes this ADS3 times uh, S3 piece that we have over here. So this M is a kind of a compactification um, uh, and um, this, uh, this is the uh, near horizon geometry. Okay, so um, uh, so uh, so this was the uh, from the uh, if you wish gravity point of view, uh, but um, from the dual gauge theory, dual open string system, uh, uh, of uh, D one D five brains. Uh, as an argument that uh, um, in the IR, in the low energy, which is where you compare with the near horizon geometry, in the IR, this is uh, described by a one plus one dimensional CFT, uh, which is uh, on the so-called moduli space of Q1 
instant tons. The UQ5 theory. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, uh, so this uh, thing is. Um, let me just write it, and then I'll explain it. Uh, where k is equal to q1. So uh, m is the same t4 or k3. Uh, so let me um, uh, recap the logic. So the idea is that the open string system of d1, d5 brains, uh, after you have wrapped the uh, four directions of the d5 brain on a small t4, this t4 or k3 is taken to be of string length, so it's a compactification. Um, then you have a one plus one dimensional field theory, which uh, uh, can be uh, viewed as uh, the D1 brains can be viewed as instantons in the uh, in, uh, D5 brain world volume theory. Uh, and uh, so the, in other words, you can, um, if there are Q1 D1 brains and Q5 D5 brains, then um, the low energy um, and the IR, you have a modelized space of these uh, Q1 instantons in a UQ5 theory. And um, uh, the UQ5 gauge theory is on this uh, T4 or K3. And uh, the mo that modelized space, there is good, uh, uh, good evidence that it is described by uh, a resolution of this so-called symmetric product. Uh, namely, you take k copies of m, where k is q1, q5, and you mod out by the symmetric group that permutes all these k copies. Okay, so that's uh, what uh, uh, the, this thing is. Um, uh, so uh, I will refer to a sort of a, a review uh, if people who are not so familiar with this can uh, uh, referred to a uh, review by uh, Justin David, Gautam Mandal, and Spentavadia, which I will uh, give the reference momentarily. Um, so this was uh, the uh, thing with uh, the um, uh, uh, with the Maldusena's proposal that there's a dual CFT, which is somewhere on this modelized space of these instantons. So that's the symmetric orbifold theory, as it is called. Uh, because you take an orbifold by the symmetric group SK. So SK is the uh, symmetric group on K elements. So it is the uh, usual permutation group. Um, so, uh, so this was uh, the D1, D5 system, but actually by the S duality of uh, um, type 2B theory, Uh, there is a similar picture. Mm. For a uh, similar picture for uh, uh, for F1 and NS5 brains, because if you uh, act by the S duality on the D1, D5, it converts it to a fundamental string NS5 brain system. And more generally, you can have a PQ strings and five brains, but uh, but by S duality, there should be a similar picture, and one can uh, consider the brain solution. Uh, uh, the near horizon geometry. Yeah, of this system uh, uh, as well. And. Um, so let me uh, mention some facts about this system. So what you find when you take the near horizon geometry uh, is that, uh, uh, again, it's a ADS3 times S3 times N. And now let me give some of the uh, parameters that uh, are there in this, uh, uh, um, uh, in this uh, near horizon geometry. There's the, the sphere radius uh, is uh, essentially the same as the ADS3 radius. Uh, and uh, these are sort of proportional to Q1 times Q5, uh, mm, or which is what I'd called K over here, capital K. 
uh, actually let me drop this k notation but it might be confusing uh, let me just call it q1 q5 uh, and um, so that's uh, that the volume of m this is the volume of the internal manifold m t4 in this case this is one in string units so i i will be always using string units so this you should understand this as multiplied by ls or square root alpha prime um, uh, so so the internal space is one um, the g string square uh, will be q5 by q1 which is what now i will actually change notation slightly uh, and call little k is uh, not to be confused with this uh, uh, capital K there, a little k uh, will be uh, in the number of uh, five brains and n will refer to the number of one brains or, or in this case, NS5 uh, brains and uh, the number of NS5 brains will be k, and the number of fundamental strings will be. Okay, so, and there is a three form NS, NS flux, uh, which is, um, uh, uh, k units, so k is the number of NS5 brains, and the NS5 brains are sources for the uh, uh, for the flux. So uh, there's uh, k units through the S3 and ADS3. So instead of the five-form flux that we normally have in ADS5 times S5, there is a three-form flux. And the nice thing about uh, uh, working in this S dual picture of the fundamental strings and NS5 brains is that this flux is um, uh, this flux is uh, NS flux, never Schwartz flux uh, uh, from the B. The two-form B field gives a three-form flux. And that's what this is. So as I said, um, oops, uh, 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 references uh, the can look at David Mandelbrotia. This is a physics report, uh, which is very, um, uh, uh, which gives a very nice uh, introduction uh, to the whole system. And in particular, you can look at sections. 2.3 and 10.1 uh, for some of the facts that I just mentioned. And um, uh, so you have this and you expect this to be again dual uh, to this m to the, let me now call it just k times n divided by s. So this is the CFT. Now I should say, I, I'll say more maybe about the CFT later, but this uh, symmetric orbifold CFT, uh, for instance, if uh, M is T4, the T4 is given by a free CFT, right? Four free bosons and the, the amount of supersymmetry we have, there'll be four free fermionic partners as well. And uh, uh, so that's the T4 seed CFT. And you take some number of copies of it and you orbifold it. Um, uh, so this theory is also a free theory because it's an orbifold of a free theory, uh, but there is a modelized space and that's what I was uh, referring to over here. There's a modelized space uh, of these, uh, of the CFT in the CFT. There is the free point, which is the non-interacting uh, CFT, but um, uh, in general, there will be marginal operators and there are actually, for the case of T4, there are, it's a 20 dimensional space of marginal operators, which you can turn on and um, there's a whole modelized space of these um, uh, CFTs. And uh, um, the, it was always believed that this is dual to the CFTs, but where exactly on the modelized space uh, the D1, D5 system lies or the N F1, NS5 system lies uh, was, has not been yet completely spelt out. Um, uh, we we believe that it uh, they are on the same modelized space. They have the same both sides have the same uh, marginal uh, operators, etc. But, um, uh, but, uh, but the detailed uh, location uh, of on the modelized space was not um, uh, understood in particular. 
what the free point correspond to, uh, namely the place where you do not turn on any marginal operator, what that corresponds to was also never fully understood. But um, now uh, we made a proposal in 2018 for where the free point corresponds to, and uh, I will be, that's one of the things we'll be talking about. But this is just as general background uh, for uh, this case. Okay, so. Um, yeah. So here you... there are the two. Yeah. So the symmetric order for the this above you have uh, m to the k, the, but the here uh, at one and s prime case so you have uh, m to the k n. This yeah, k is, just... I, I think I should not have done this. I don't know. Um, let me. Um, uh, let me. Uh, I meant to use a different uh, this thing. So maybe you should think of uh, m to the uh, just q one q five. Ah, I see. They are different. Okay. Yeah, I I should not have used this uh, k here. I was in. I mean, in our uh, papers, we have used capital K for that and small K for this. But when I write, I think the distinction between capital K and small K goes away. So think of capital K as uh, Q five and um, uh, uh, capital uh, little K as Q five and uh, N as Q one. Uh, so that's uh, so. Uh, this is the standard notation people use: uh, Q one, Q five. Uh, uh, but uh, it will be sort of. Uh, more appropriate for us to uh, mm, uh, uh, mm, talk in terms of little k and n because uh, for reasons that will become clear. Uh, so by the way, the fact that the g-string square is k over n means that um, we can be in the perturbative regime provided k over n is um, much less than one. So let me also note that down here. Uh, so it's uh, perturbative if... Uh, uh, G string, which is uh, K over N, G string square, which is K over N, is much, much less than that. Okay, so, um, so we can, uh, we can uh, work in the perturbative regime if we have our K and N appropriate team. All right, um, so, now, the advantage of um, uh, the F1 NS5 brain is uh, that we can go beyond the supergravity limit. And, and so go beyond supergravity because uh, uh, of course, that's how the original Maldacena correspondence was always uh, derived. There's a supergravity solution corresponding to these deep brains, and, uh, and you uh, work with that. But in this particular case, uh, we know uh, how to go beyond uh, the supergravity because uh, you can, um, the uh, theory with NSNS flux. of this background, maybe I shouldn't say theory, um, should call it this background. And SNS flux uh, can be described by a world sheet sigma model, by a conventional Yeah. So, um, so, so I will, of course, spend uh, some time. So the point at this point, all I just uh, want to contrast this is with, unlike the cases with Ramon Ramon flux. So the original ADS five times S five case, there's a five form Ramon Ramon flux. So you don't really know how to describe 
with by a conventional world sheet sigma model. Uh, um, uh, and even the D1, D5 system, there were the S dual to this system uh, uh, would have had instead of NS3 form flux, the RR3 form flux, which is present in type 2B uh, uh, as well. So it would have been in terms of uh, K units of RR flux through S3 and ADS3. And that could again have been difficult to study. Uh, so this is why uh, the case with the NSNS flux is uh, much more tractable as we will see. Then we can write down a world sheet sigma model with K units of uh, uh, NSNS flux. Um, uh, so this will have uh, K units. of this three form flux uh, 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 on a on an ads3 times s3 uh, with uh, radius square root k so large k is uh, the supergravity limit uh, but in principle you can uh, what i want to uh, say is that you can work at arbitrary k over here uh, uh, so in some ways, uh, that's like the radius deformation in my uh, original lamppost slide. Uh, the, uh, you can now take the radius from k equals to infinity all the way to small values of k. So what is this sigma model? Let me uh, say, uh, let me introduce the sigma model. Uh, so this, the sigma model, uh, world sheet sigma model, uh, it has... Uh, uh, 4,4 4 supersymmetry in the world sheet uh, and um, is uh, based on uh, target space, which is ABS3, as I said. Uh, so uh, I will mostly take T4, but anyway, uh, let, okay, let me make it T4. Uh, ADS three times S three times T four. So this is given by an SL two R level K plus two So it's given by uh, uh, um, uh, a world sheet theory based on uh, Vesumino Witten models of uh, uh, SL2R at level K plus two and SU2 at level K minus two, where K is this uh, 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 when you have K units of NS flux. Um, so, uh, so let me uh, briefly uh, motivate that. Uh, that's because uh, you can think of uh, firstly the uh, SU2, uh, the T4 piece is the standard T4 piece. As I said, it's uh, uh, for um, uh, so T4 piece is uh, four free bosons and fermions. And so uh, that part. I, I have a question. Yeah. So yeah. Is it Worth worth to see supersymmetry or it's it would yeah. be worth. Yeah, when I said uh, 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 sorry. Uh, so the target space has four comma four supersymmetry. So there's a global four comma four supersymmetry. Uh, so when you say world sheet, yes, there's a global four comma four supersymmetry because these target spaces have that much supersymmetry. Uh, and uh, um, uh, so that global symmetry will be part of the space time supersymmetry. Uh, uh, After from projection of the, or uh, of the or even, sorry. Uh, after some projection or uh, no 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 this is uh, the because it's like T four uh, um, uh, the ADS three times S three times T four uh, the original mm -hmm. B brain system preserves um, eight supersymmetries but which is sort of enhanced to. 16 supersymmetries in the near horizon uh, uh, limit. So this, uh, this world sheet, uh, global supersymmetry on the world sheet, 
uh, is a reflection of that space-time symmetry. Uh, okay. So there will be uh, n equal to four uh, uh, current algebra, uh, I mean, n equals to four superconformal algebra, global superconformal algebra on the world sheet. But as a, um, a critical string theory, this should be thought of as an n equals to one critical string theory. But I, I will say something more about that later, but at least the standard uh, formulation, yeah, let me write this as an n equals to one critical string theory. I'll say more about this. Uh, so uh, the, uh, it's like uh, when you consider uh, a string theory on a Calabria or something, there is, uh, global uh, two comma two supersymmetry, but um, the uh, the part that is gauged is just the n equals to one supersymmetry of the world sheet. Okay, so uh, the T four, uh, yes. So uh, just considering this NS NS flux background for the F one NS five ring system, will that give exactly the same results as D one D five system with RR flux or? Be so it will be related by S duality. Uh, so it, it will, in some sense, give you the uh, description of the D1, D5 system at strong coupling, um, because S duality is a symmetry of the, the same. It won't give you a description of the D1, D5 system at weak string coupling. Uh, 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 so yeah, so that's, uh, so uh, what do the D1, D5 system is described by at weak string coupling in the D1, D5 system frame? That uh, we still don't, uh, we are not, I'm not making any proposal or any uh, uh, thing about that. Thank you. But, so, um, uh, so let me explain this. Uh, so um, the SL2R is actually, you can think of as a, an equals to one supersymmetric Vesemino Witten model. So SL2R comes because the ADS3 group manifold in some ways, uh, the Lorentzian group manifold can be thought of as a universal cover of SL2R, uh, um, uh, the group manifold. Uh, so, um, so, uh, so you can think of this as, uh, uh, yeah, you can think of uh, 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 the supersymmetric Vesemino Witten model uh, based on the SL2R as the uh, ordinary Vesemino-Witten model, but with a shifted level and three fermions. And so this follows from the standard properties of a supersymmetric Vesemino-Witten model that there's a shift in the level by two if when you, uh, and you can uh, rewrite the generators of the supersymmetric Vesemino Witten model in terms of an ordinary Vesemino Witten model. So, this is a bosonic uh, Vesemino Witten model. Uh, 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 and the fermions are decoupled from it. Uh, so, uh, so, that's the reason why you have this factor over here, the uh, uh, SL2R k plus 2 factor. Uh, so, I've, I haven't, uh, I should have probably written over here. Uh, um, plus fermions, uh, plus actually 10 fermions. Uh, so let me write the last piece as well. Uh, so you have again in the SU2, once again, you have a supersymmetric Vesemino Witten model, but this can be thought of as an ordinary Vesemino Witten model, but with a level shifted to K minus two, and then again, three free fermions. So, uh, so uh, this SU2 describes the S3 part of the compactification, the, the S3 part over here. Uh, and uh, uh, so and that uh, with NSNS flux, uh, maybe many of you are familiar that when you have a three form flux through the S3, then you can write down a conformal field theory and it is essentially the SU2 uh, resume in a written conformal field theory. And uh, uh, in the supersymmetric case, when you have K units of flux, you can alternatively view these as uh, the bosonic resume in a written model with the shifted level and uh, fermions. All right. So, so this is, as you see, it's, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this whole thing is in some ways, uh, uh, so this is what we call the NSR description. Uh, 
because this is in the standard never Schwartz remote description. Uh, it doesn't have space time supersymmetry manifest, but it has world sheet supersymmetry. Yeah. Okay, so any questions? Um, uh, so is there are some some of the uh, green Schwartz like a description for this. I will uh, describe. I will come to that. Um, okay. uh, I'll come to that uh, more soon. Uh, but uh, right now, let's stick with this because we have. Uh, that's the advantage of the NS, uh, uh, the fundamental string NS five brain system is that you can have an NSR description because there are no Ramon Ramon fluxes. So that's what. Uh, I'm uh, trying to exploit over here. Uh, so uh, let's just uh, see how the central charges work. So the C of the SL2R piece. Uh, and so let me write SL2 plus fermions, the central charge. So uh, the SL2 piece has a central charge. Uh, so you, uh, you have, this is the piece coming from SL2R level K plus two, because you, uh, you have the um, level uh, times the dimension, which is three uh, on the numerator and uh, K plus two minus two, which is K in the denominator. So this is the part coming from the uh, bosonic piece of this, and then there are uh, three fermions, so I have this. Similarly, I have for the SU2 plus fermions, uh, I have now it's level K minus two, but uh, K minus two plus two in the denominator. So that's the piece from this and the three fermions that gives you that. And finally, there is C of the T4 uh, which is equal to uh, uh, just four times one plus half. So that's equal to six. And so you can check that C total is equal to 15. It's independent of K because essentially these two terms, uh, when you add these two, they cancel. Uh, and uh, this is what you have. This is the critical central charge. Uh, for n equals to one NSR string. Okay, uh, so this is a critical string background, and uh, we note that also um, another point to note is that uh, the number of uh, bosonic degrees of freedom. is equal to SL2R, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, the, the, there are three currents, and so the three bosonic degrees of freedom from there, three bosonic degrees of freedom from SU2, and uh, uh, four from the T4. So this is three plus three plus four, which is 10. And uh, similarly, number of uh, fermionic degrees of freedom is also three plus three. So it's uh, like in flat space, but it is now, it's a curved background, but it's a SL, but it's roughly speaking for large K, it will go to flat space because the SL2R will go to, uh, in fact, you can see from the central charges also for large K, this will just become one. Uh, so it becomes SL2R will become like uh, R3, and the SU2 will also become like a, a flat space, three-dimensional flat space. Uh, and then there's the T4. So this is some, it's a deformation with uh, NS, NS flux, but it's a controllable world sheet deformation of the flat space. Uh, in this thing. So I can th think of this as some deformation of flat space. So, So 
So this is a, a independent of anything, independent even of ADS CFT and so on. I think this is a very useful example because it's one of the uh, most tractable and uh, uh, illuminating examples of a string theory on a curved ba space-time background where uh, you do not need uh, to, I mean, you, you don't need to be in some supergravity limit. This is an exact CFT. So that's uh, uh, one of, I think, uh, that was one of the things that always attracted me to this model um, because it gives you a way to see how string theory will behave when you go away from the flat space, which is where we have most of our intuition. Uh, but uh, we'll see that there are many interesting things about the uh, ADS-3 case, uh, uh, which you can uh, explicitly see. Okay, so any questions? Um, so you might think that uh, we have uh, kind of, uh, I mean, uh, um, I have one question. Uh, it is some simple question. So here you are considering like a super string theory, but uh, like a like a, the critical bosonic string theory. Is there some bosonic version of this? Uh, yeah, theory? people. In fact, uh, the original Maldasena Oguri uh, considered a bosonic string version. Mm -hmm. I mean, people have not. I, uh, yeah, I think you can have an SL2R piece, but then you need to have some other piece of the central charge, which will compensate and make it 26. And you need to probably also be able to satisfy Einstein's equation. So you need something with opposite curvature, uh, um, but uh, it's not something that has been explored because like the bosonic string, it also has a tachyon in it. So. Uh, um, so, but it is not something that has been studied very much, and I think it should be. Uh, okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so you might think, okay, I gave you a description of this world sheet theory in terms of some Wesemino Witten conformal field theories. You might think, oh, WZW models are solvable. Um, uh, um, uh, are exactly solvable CFTs, um, two-dimensional CFTs. So you might think, oh, we are done. Okay, it's not as not as simple as flat space CFT. Uh, so um, uh, uh, so uh, so are we kind of done? We can just use some results from there, and we. Um, but the answer is actually no. It's uh, it's actually quite subtle the, because since um, SL2R uh, 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 is a non compact Wesemino Witten model, There are subtleties, uh, and uh, there are firstly there are continuous families of representations. That will be one um, uh, one com uh, complication because unlike an SU two Wesemino Witten model where you know they are classified by the affine representations are classified essentially in terms of a primary, which is given by ordinary SU2 finite dimensional representations. Uh, here, the SL2R is a non-compact group, so its unitary representations are infinite dimensional, uh, firstly. And so uh, the, uh, the primary states uh, that we will be working with will have these continuous fam infinite dimensional families. And in fact, there are families of SL2R representations that are labeled by a continuous parameter. And so we'll have to consider these. And in addition, uh, at the level of the current algebra, so this is already true uh, at the level of the zero modes, if you wish, uh, for the SL2R global symmetry. But in addition, uh, at the level of the current algebra, Uh, need to consider what are called spectrally flow representations. Uh, 
we need to consider a new class of affine representations of representations of the affine algebra, or the current algebra. Uh, which will be called spectrally flowed representations. And I'll, I'll describe these uh, in some detail. Okay, so uh, now let me uh, explain this uh, thing following Maldasena and Uguri. Uh, Sorry, so can I ask you a small question? Sure. Yes, yeah, so, so just for the particular case, k equal to one, then yes. this uh, SU2 has negative level. Yes, so, uh, so that will indeed be a very important uh, observation, uh, which uh, will uh, tell us that we need to go beyond this uh, NSR description. And uh, I will be spending not maybe, uh, maybe at the end of today's lecture, if I have time, or if not uh, in the beginning of tomorrow's lecture will be about this point. Uh, I see, so you mean that we also understand some properties of this? Yes, at yes, level. Uh, okay. uh, at level one. But uh, strictly speaking, uh, uh, you're right that at this stage, everything I'm saying is true for k greater than or equal to two. k equal to two, the SU2 becomes trivial, but k, k greater than or equal to two, uh, uh, things are well-defined. So uh, uh, okay. yes, and the k equals to one is indeed going to be special in many ways, as we will see. Okay, thank you. Uh, but it will be useful to understand the generic K result uh, following Maldusena and Oguri to be able to appreciate what is special about K equals to one. Okay, so um, so uh, for, uh, following, we'll follow Maldusena and Oguri. Um, uh, sorry for the basic yeah. question. So uh, sure. here, the uh, non compact case, uh, the level also should be integer or need not to be integer? Uh, uh, sorry, which? The, uh, no, because the level is the same on both sides. Uh, so uh, in uh, fact, uh, this k is the same, right? It's the k. So you know that k must be an integer. Yes, that's a good point I should have mentioned. Um, we know that SU2 at level k, the k has to be quantized to be an integer. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, the k here, uh, the SL2R has the same k because that's how the central charges add up um, and that's quantized. Another way to say it is that we know that the NS3 form flux is also integer quantized. Ah, um, sure. and, so, so, and this K is the number of units of NS flux. So, so that has to be an integer. Uh, uh, but strictly speaking, SL2R, yes, could be defined for any value of K, not necessarily an integer. But in the context of the string theory background that we are considering, uh, we will restrict to the case where it's an integer. And in Bojanic theory, uh, K is some un might be unclear. Yeah, for the bosonic theory, that's a, that might be unclear, especially if there's no flux uh, that we are really considering. Uh, so yeah, so okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, Maldasena and Oguri had a series of papers in the early 2000s about um, uh, about the uh, uh, the uh, ADS3 string theory, and they did a wonderful. I mean, I, these are I think very beautiful papers, and they are quite technical and difficult papers. But uh, I, in, a, in a series of three papers, they really understood many aspects of the. Uh, string theory on the uh, I, with this NSNS flux. Um, and uh, so I will uh, use some of their results mostly from their first paper, which talked about the spectrum of the theory. And, uh, uh, and actually following them, we'll focus on the bosonic case, uh, uh, the bosonic SL2R. Uh, 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 because after all, we saw that it is um, I mean, uh, I'll just uh, I'll call it SL2R level K, but in the supersymmetric case, you should understand that K will be replaced by K plus two. Uh, but uh, I will, uh, in fact, so many of the things that I will say right now, K doesn't even have to be an integer like Yumi was asking. Um, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, at the back of our mind, uh, just keep uh, keep the fact that we will be 
uh, our motivation will be to look at it ultimately in the case of the super string embedding in which k will be replaced by k plus two and uh, uh, and um, uh, it will be an integer uh, so but in any case most of the features the new features that i mentioned over here this feature and this feature uh, these features will be present for the yeah, um, they they are captured by just the SL2R level K bosonic um, uh, theory. So we will uh, stick to that. So let me write down the uh, the current algebra generators. Uh, so you have J3, J plus minus are the generators of uh, SL2R uh, and they obey mm, this relation. Uh, and so J3 with J3 is this, uh, J3 and J plus minus. So this are the current algebra generators and the level K. Uh, that's why uh, the K appears over here in the supersymmetric case, as I said, we should replace K by K plus two. And the Virasoro generators uh, are given by the Sugawara construction. Sukhara stress tensor. So, namely, the this is, I think, uh, one over k minus two, and the usual quadratic uh, construction of the, and so there's a sum over a, so a is equal to plus minus. Uh, and so this is the mm, mm, this is the uh, Sugawara construction. And uh, by the way, in this uh, signature over here, because of the uh, SL2R is non-compact again. So this signature, unlike in the case of uh, um, mm, uh, unlike in the case of uh, the SU2, this will be something like J plus J minus minus J3 square. Uh, so, uh, so that's the sort of uh, Cartan metric uh, that you have for SL two R. Uh, I should have probably written it uh, in terms of the Cartan metric, um, but um, um, since SL two R is of, uh, so let me uh, note down the observation that since SL two R is uh, of in indefinite signature. Um, the uh, L0 uh, is not bounded from below, at least not obviously. So that's a complication. And so we need to make sure physical states are bounded from below. So that uh, is already something not guaranteed to us uh, that uh, when you impose the physical state conditions on the string theory, they uh, have space time energy bounded from below. So, by the way, the space time energy is actually nothing but the zeroth component of J30. Uh, uh, so, one minute. Uh, and why is that? Uh, that's because, uh, remember, this SL2R that we are talking about is nothing but the global isometry of the ABS3 piece. Uh, and the J, the J30, J plus minus zero are nothing but the Mobius symmetry generators in the space-time. 
so they are, if you wish, uh, so maybe this is useful to note down here, uh, that uh, J30 corresponds to L0 space-time. J plus minus uh, zero corresponds to L plus minus one in space-time. Because these are the Mobius generators in the space-time CFD. Uh, so you should distinguish between the world sheet CFD, which has its own L0 and um, the Verasoro generators, and the space-time, there is a, because we are in ADS-3, the dual space-time is a two-dimensional CFT. Uh, and uh, we know from Brown and Heno and so on that uh, there is a Verasoro symmetry in the space asymptotically in ADS-3 space-times. So there is the space-time Verasoro, which we should distinguish from the world sheet Verasoro. And the space-time Verasoro, at least the zero mode generators, the Mobius generators of the space-time are related to the zero modes of the world sheet current algebra J30. And so, it, so, uh, so, uh, so there's the, uh, and the L0 won't be related to anything directly in terms of the space-time, but uh, the J30, J plus minus zero are related like this. Okay, so. Um, uh, so in particular, this will be important that the space-time J30, uh, space-time energy is, uh, uh, well, the left-moving space-time energy is really J30. There'll be also right movers, which will correspond to the space-time L0 bar, L0 uh, uh, plus minus one, uh, the right-hand side. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, uh, so we have this. We also need to worry about uh, we also need to make sure and there are no negative norm states in the string theory. Yeah. Because once again, because of this indefinite signature, there's a space, a time-like direction also, right? Um, uh, so uh, that will, uh, the, gen, uh, the, the just like in flat space string theory, when you work in a covariant formalism, you have the time-like oscillators, which will have negative norm. Uh, um, similarly here, there will be the time-like directions in the ADS3, which will have negative norm, uh, because of, again, this indefinite signature that I mentioned uh, here. Uh, that SL2R uh, indefinite signature is a reflection of the space-time indefinite signature, the Minkowski signature. Uh, and uh, uh, so you have to make sure that there are no negative norm states in the physical string theory. So when you impose the physical state conditions, there shouldn't be any negative norm states. Is this clear? Mm -hmm. So these are uh, some of the things which are not obviously guaranteed. And that's why this theory is more subtle. Uh, uh, okay, so, so first uh, consider states uh, which where L0 is bounded from below. So there's a way to uh, construct states uh, where L0 is bounded from below, and that is the following. Uh, uh, you consider affine representations. Uh, so representations of this current algebra uh, uh, where uh, the J3 or plus minus the positive modes, so these annihilate some highest weight state. And then, um, uh, so once you have uh, these annihilating some highest weight state, then of course you will not, uh, then only uh, the J3 plus minus 
with the negative modes, uh, the n greater than one, uh, greater than or equal to one, uh, uh, these will uh, create descendants. Uh, I have a question. I already confused. Uh, yeah, so, uh, just, uh, one uh, one second. Let me just uh, okay. uh, complete this. Uh, so only the negative modes of the currents will create descendants and uh, will uh, will have the they will have uh, uh, the delta L L zero will be positive because supposing you have some high sweet state which has some L zero, then uh, since all the positive modes are annihilated, uh, you can't lower the L0 value, you can only increase the L0 value, which you would do by acting on by the negative uh, modes. And the zero modes would uh, just, um, uh, the zero modes, J uh, at three plus minus, uh, these zero modes uh, on the highest weight state would uh, would uh, create a representation of the global group SL2R. So the zero mode, so if we consider uh, therefore representations of SL2R for the zero modes, and then we build an affine tower on it, um, such that the positive modes are annihilating the, that state, then uh, that gives you a set of representations or states where L0 is bounded from below. Yes, Jungi, you asked me. So uh, previously you said L0 is uh, not bounded, but uh, I mean, so when you say L0 is not bounded, is it world sheet L0 or space time L0? I, I will most, if I don't put any subscripts, I mean a world sheet L0. Uh, so there are, there are two problems which are not obviously related. In fact, the space time L0 is also not obviously bounded from below. But they are slightly distinct problems. One is uh, the world sheet L0 is not bounded from below. That's one issue. Uh, and uh, it will, uh, there will be, because of that, it will turn out that the space time L0 will also not be bounded from below, uh, at least when we consider the, the full set of states. Uh, but we will see that the physical states, once you impose the physical conditions, then L0 both in the world sheet and the L0 in the space time, uh, both, uh, both of these will be bounded then from below. So whenever I need to talk about space time, I will put a subscript like a superscript like ST for space time. But um, uh, otherwise, if I'm not putting anything, everything is understood to be on the world sheet. So world sheet L0 is not, if, if L0 on the world sheet is not bounded below, then it's, it leads to the, this, uh, 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 space time L0 is not was bounded. Or... They will be related, yeah. I mean, they, one leads uh... to the other, but uh, in a little more complicated way, as will hopefully become clearer as we discuss those representations. But right now, okay. I'm considering representations where uh, the L0 is bounded from below. And uh, how am I engineering such representations? I'm engineering these representations by looking at a highest weight state, which is annihilated by all the positive modes of the J3. So they are affine primaries of uh, J3 um, of the current algebra. And so the, the highest weight state carries some representation of the global SL2R um, because the zero modes will act on those highest weight state and generate this representation. And only the negative modes of the J3 will create the affine tower uh, and uh, that will give you a, a representation where delta L0 will be always uh, positive because uh, only negative modes are appearing. So the L0 can only increase. L0 cannot decrease. Whatever the highest weight state has some L0, which is bounded from below, that's what will be the L0 of this thing. Yeah. So like uh, if we ignore the space time uh, interpretation, uh, is there any other reason why L0 is bounded from below? Like, uh, no, there's no real reason. Uh, there, there's no real reason for L0 to be bounded from below when you have uh, this thing. In fact, uh, even in bosonic string theory, you have this problem uh, because okay. uh, there are time-like oscillators and, uh, uh, well, 
in the bosonic string theory on negative norm states, you don't really have L0, but you normally choose the L0 to be bounded from below in the bosonic flat space string theory. Uh, but you can imagine that, I mean, there could have been states, uh, there are situations where L0, uh, because uh, these are not necessarily unitary theories on the string world sheet. So there's no reason for L0 to be bounded from below. But all you need to, all you would like to see is that the space-time energy is bounded from below. And in some sense, in, when you impose physical states, uh, that the, the L0 turns out to be effectively bounded there. So, uh, but yeah, you're right. Um, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, what kind, so the question is uh, now we have, uh, we are first considering these set of states where, uh, uh, which are built on an affine tower on uh, representations of SL2R. But I told you already that SL2R, the being non-compact group, has infinite uh, has uh, rep many representations, all of which are infinite dimensional unitary representations. Um, uh, so uh, um, Maldusena and Oguri, based on various reasons, including the fact that if when you consider a large K limit, uh, you need to have normalizable wave functions, um, uh, et cetera, they were led to two um, and so well led to uh, uh, affine primaries. Uh, um, built on two sets of two different classes, I should say. Uh, and uh, these are unitary, uh, unitary irreducible representations uh, for the zero modes, as I said. And what are these? Um, so these are the following. Uh, there's what are called uh, there are the first set, uh, uh, let me call them the continuous representations. So these are standard representations of SL2R, which you can find in any uh, uh, book on SL2R representation theory. In fact, I think uh, a year or so ago, a couple of years ago, uh, Kitayev had a set of notes on the archive on uh, representations of SL2R, uh, which is a good reference you can look at. Uh, but uh, we'll need only some of these uh, representations. Now, what will be most important for us is what are called the continuous representations, and they'll be denoted by two labels, uh, J and Lambda, uh, and they consist of states of the form, essentially, I'll explain this in a moment. So this uh, so um, so this is the J three zero eigenvalue. This is the Casimir label. So there's a quadratic Casimir, uh, which is so um, so uh, so I uh, so the labels. Um, so just SL2R is a bit like SU2 in the sense that uh, things are labeled by uh, a principle um, by the Casimir label, which labels the representation. And that's what we are calling J over here. Uh, so the Casimir is like SU2 uh, Casimir, but it's uh, uh, being non-compact. It's actually written as J into J minus one minus sign. Um, 
Uh, and uh, so you can label the representation by this J. Uh, and J can, uh, a priori J can take any value, unlike SU2, where J was a positive integer. Uh, here J can uh, positive half integer, but here J uh, can take any value. And in particular, we'll consider the family where J is half plus I times P. These are a set of normalizable unitary representations called the continuous representations. And their Casimir is one fourth plus P squared. If you put in this value of J into the Casimir, um, then of course the states in this representation are labeled by J and uh, what you would call in SU2, the M label, the, principle, the quantum number, the J30 eigenvalue. And here, unlike in SU2, the J3 quantum number can, is not related to J. Uh, uh, so you can, um, uh, but, they, the, uh, but the quantum number can take uh, takes, uh, discrete values, uh, which are given by some lambda plus an integer. When you act by J plus, it will change the J3 eigenvalue by one uh, or minus one, uh, J plus or J minus. Uh, so, but these are infinite representations unlike SU2. So uh, they're not, uh, the J30 can take negative values because N goes over all the integers. Uh, so the, these are infinite in both directions. So you have some value lambda, which by, because uh, uh, it doesn't matter when you shift by an integer, you can take lambda to be in this uh, canonical range. It's a real number in this range. And uh, the J3 eigenvalues of an arbitrary state differ from it by uh, an integer. So, so if you wish, uh, these are uh, states, uh, 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 unlike in SU2, where things go between minus J to plus J, here they go from minus infinity to plus infinity in uh, uh, steps, but uh, steps of integers, but uh, um, uh, which are um, labeled by an additional parameter lambda that can take a continuous value between zero. And one. So this J and lambda together label this uh, family of representations. Okay, so that's one set of representations which will be useful for us. Um, uh, May I yeah. ask, are there uh, highest weight uh, representations? Yes. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Uh, these are not highest weight representations highest weight. Uh, because there is nothing which is, um, uh, yeah, that, that, exactly. Because this, oops, uh, uh, mm, uh, the, these, uh, these eigenvalues uh, go between minus infinity to, so as I said to R, they are not highest weight representations of SL2R. Uh, but the next set that I will be writing ha are highest weight uh, representations, uh, but uh, mm, uh, that uh, is the so-called discrete representations, a uh, discrete family of uh, representations. Uh, Thank um, So this will be uh, denoted by DJ plus. which will be again labeled by two quantum numbers. Um, and now this N over here, unlike the N above, uh, takes only positive integer values. Uh, and so there are two differences between the things over here. First, well, there are several differences, but let me spell out all the differences firstly you'll take J to be a real number greater than half uh, for, this is for normalizability. Uh, and uh, uh, it takes real values because we are actually working on the universal cover of SL2R. Uh, so once again, this is uh, the Casimir label. The Casimir is uh, again, minus J into J minus one like before. And this is the J30 eigenvalue, but the J30 eigenvalue is now correlated with uh, the J. So in fact, uh, this is a, a state where J0 minus is equal to zero. So if you wish, this is highest weight or lowest weight, uh, uh, one of them. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so let me call it just uh, with abuse of notation, let me call it highest weight state. It probably technically it's lowest weight, but anyhow. Um, uh, so um, 
Uh, so you can, uh, there's also a conjugate representation. You can, so you see what happens, there's a JJ, a state with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, quantum numbers JJ, and then you generate all the others by acting by J pluses. And so the, uh, the, quant uh, the M quantum number increases by uh, units of one above the J. So that's what this whole representation is. Uh, and there's a, you can write a conjugate representation dj minus where m is equal to minus j minus n so that would be a if, if this was a lowest weight representation that would have been a highest weight representation so but they are conjugates to each other and i sort of not uh, not con uh, consider them separately so these will be the representations that will be essentially important for us uh, so uh, what uh, uh, we will do is uh, 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 we will um, we act we can act on uh, these states. Remember, these are sort of the highest weight states of the affine representation. So we can act on these states by J three plus minus with n. Uh, no, minus n rather than n greater than or equal to one. And uh, this uh, generates the corresponding affine representations, which I will denote by a hat. So these were purely SL2 representations, but when I want to denote the affine representations, I will denote them with a hat. And these are. Uh, highest weight representations. Of the affine algebra. Okay, and in fact, the L zero uh, on the ground state. Uh, 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 I should let me. L zero on the ground state. Is just given by the uh, quadratic Casimir of this thing, and uh, remember in the Sugawara construction there's a normalization, so k minus two. So uh, this is the uh, uh, so the L zero is bounded from below, as I said, and uh, uh, you can the, you generate the affine tower by uh, acting upon by these. Uh, uh, states and that gives you the uh, um, gives you the whole tower about this. Okay, so this is the um, this is the uh, these are the so called these are the more straightforward representations. Uh, but uh, now we'll introduce what are called the spectrally flowed representations. Uh, uh, but uh, maybe I should ask Jungi this. I see that I've, I'm at the one and a half hour mark. Uh, I'm, I'm of course going a, a slower than I, I expected, but uh, depending on, um, should I stop right now or uh, uh, what would you suggest? Uh, or uh, it's up to you. It's, uh, you don't have any, you can freely keep going or yeah, uh, it's yeah, totally I mean, up to you. <laughs> As a, I mean, if I, uh, I mean, this would have been a natural place to stop, but uh, okay. if I take another 15 minutes, I can cover the spectrally flowed representations. Would that be okay if I covered 15 minutes? Um, yeah, it's okay, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it totally up to you. So whatever you prefer. No, no, I, I just yeah. want to know whether, uh, I mean, it's uh, one and a half hours already, so I don't want to. Uh, uh, to there is no like a strict rule, so. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll just uh, try to wrap up in 10 or 15 minutes for today's. This thing by introducing the spectrally float, uh, then we'll be in a good shape for tomorrow uh, uh, to use these representations. Uh, okay, so. <clears throat> Uh, so let me uh, talk of the what uh, this uh, because these uh, this is one of the most uh, important notions uh, that was actually introduced by Henningsen and others uh, earlier. But uh, Maldusena and Ogori realized that these spectrally flowed sectors um, uh, are um, are important for uh, uh, the full physical string spectrum.
so uh, so this is based on the following observation which is actually true for any uh, current algebra that uh, the uh, but let me uh, uh, state it for sl2r uh, 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 the, the current algebra has the following automorphism so this is essentially uh, I mean, the, uh, and that's the technical way of saying it, but it's essentially a way of saying that supposing I define now, uh, supposing me, let me make a, uh, define a set of tilde generators, which are related to my original current algebra generators in the following way. Uh, so let me, so the left hand side, uh, so these are definitions of the J tilde and J tilde three, J, J tilde plus minus. Uh, and the statement is the, uh, the fact that it's an automorphism is the statement that this preserves the commutation relations of the current algebra. So remember I wrote down uh, uh, here the commutation relations. Uh, so the claim is that supposing instead of uh, uh, supposing I had J3, J plus minus satisfying this current algebra, and I defined a new set of uh, these J tildes and computed their commutators, um, I would get exactly the same answer. Uh, and if I substituted J tildes in terms of J3 and, and use the earlier commutation relations, I would find that the J3 tildes and the, the j tilde plus minus uh, satisfy the same current algebra with the same level. Uh, and so these, uh, are, these automorphisms are labeled by an integer w. So w has to be an integer because you are shifting the modes. In the case of j plus minus, you are shifting the modes plus or minus by w. Um, uh, and um, uh, so, so for any integer, so this is an automorphism. Uh, for any integer k, any integer w. Uh, okay, so um, and you can define a Virasoro generator in terms of the tilde modes using the tilde Sugawara con uh, stress tensor, uh, and what you find is that uh, the uh, and there's a uh, Virasoro gen the Virasoro generator is also uh, given delta n. Yeah, so uh, the, there's a tilde Virasoro mode, which is also uh, related to the original Virasoro mode by some shift like this. Uh, uh, so and and then the ln tildes and the j tildes will obey the same commutation relations of uh, the affine prime that affine primaries do. Uh, so and in fact, uh, this obeys Virasoro algebra. The tilde variables also obey Virasoro algebra with the same central charge. Okay, so, so I'm so far just defining a set of new variables or tilde variables. Uh, I haven't done anything. I'm just claiming that there is this automorphism of the algebra. This is there in uh, current algebras for SU2, SUN uh, in general. Uh, but for non compact groups, it will be particularly interesting for the following reason. Uh, if we consider uh, an affine representation in terms of the tilde variables, the, til uh, the tilde modes, namely, just like I did before, but consider a representation where, which is annihilated by J tilde plus minus or J tilde three, 
positive modes. Uh, so let's consider an, uh, a representation of the form that I described over here. So here I had um, uh, these zero modes based on some J3, uh, J3 zero, J plus minus zero. And then I had uh, these J3 plus minus the negative modes generated by affine tower. Uh, um, uh, but now let me create the same representation um, interpret it um, uh, by, by thinking of it as something annihilated by high weight representation. Uh, uh, so this is a high weight rep uh, in terms of the tildes, in terms of J tilde. Um, uh, but now, Uh, but view this in terms of the original modes. Actually, I wanted to show a picture earlier. Let me let me uh, just uh, excuse me a second. Yeah, I actually wanted to show this picture. Uh, uh, this is a useful picture to keep in mind uh, uh, for the unflowed representation. So uh, sorry about this, but let me take you back to the original unflowed representations. I mean, the ordinary affine representations. So just to give a sense, these are taken from the Maldasena Oguri paper. Um, uh, so what do we have? As I said, in those cases, we have a, a highest weight state. Uh, so L0 takes this value that I had written over here. Uh, and then, then you have these, let's say in the, let's say I'm looking at DJ plus. So as I said, there's a J30, which is given by this. Uh, there's a state JJ over here, J30 is J. And then there are all the uh, zero mode. This this gives you a, the DJ, the zero mode representation. And then you have the affine tower. And so you will uh, act by J plus minus and you'll go up like this, uh, like this. Uh, if you act by J minus, you will go here. If you act by J3, you'll go here. If you act by uh, uh, J plus, you'll go here and so on. This is at level one and then level two. So as I said earlier, the L0 is bounded from below uh, and you only increase the L0 values, but J30 is not bound. I mean, J30 can keep decreasing uh, even over here, but, uh, that, but still at any given L0, it's bounded. Mm. Okay, so this is a useful picture uh, uh, to keep in mind. But now we consider the spectrally flowed representations. And what they do is that uh, if we now interpret them in terms of the original modes. Uh, so if, uh, so we are, what we are doing is we interpret them in terms of the original modes. But you see that what were positive modes for J plus J tilde are not necessarily positive modes for the original of the six. So now, if I interpret the, this representation in term, which was built from the tilde modes in terms of the original modes, these are not highest weight representations anymore because some J plus minus, some negative modes of Js will not annihilate it anymore. And I will show you the analog diagram immediately. Uh, to make this uh, sort of clear. So, uh, but let me just uh, first make the statements and then uh, uh, explain it. Mm, uh, so, um, uh, the, uh, so the original modes will always be the physical generators. So you should always think of this tilde modes as just some trick to kind of generate some new representations. We'll only be having the original 
modes the, without the tildes are the actual physical generators. And the space-time energy will be given in terms of J30, etc. The Verasoro condition will be imposed on the original L0, uh, etc. So the uh, so. Uh, this is just a trick to generate these representations. So what we have is we have a, mm, a highest weight representation of the tilde modes, but it is not a highest weight representation in terms of the original. Mm. Okay, so it's not uh, because of the shift in mode numbers. Uh, so, and in fact, neither L zero or J30 will be bounded from below. Yeah, and so let me uh, show you the picture for that. Okay, so, so the picture is now, uh, just think of, uh, uh, so, it, so this is the L0 tilde and J30, that's the slanted axis. So you see in terms of the original, in terms of the tilde modes, this is very much like what we had before things there was something that was uh, that was a highest weight state and then you had uh, things uh, so in terms of l0 tilde it is bounded from below uh, and j30 tilde you keep increasing in this way so that's what the slanted axes are for it's slanted because the uh, the l L tildes are related to the Ls by this thing which involves a, it's a linear combination of L and J. So, so now if that's why if you interpret L0 tilde in terms of the L0 and the J30, then the states look like this uh, because this is uh, tilted from below. You see the J30 can be in terms of J30, even though J30 tilde was uh, something that you had uh, uh, it went like this, but J30, uh, original J30 can be as negative as you want because there will be, the, in fact, the, there are uh, these shifts and uh, so things just uh, can go below. And similarly, in terms of the original L0, uh, you can see that uh, that can also become more, uh, more, that can also, L0 is also not bounded from below. In fact, this is in terms of the order, if I consider a state labeled by J tilde, uh, if I consider now that the, uh, in terms of the tilde modes, I had a state labeled by J tilde, then in terms of the original L0, it will have, uh, it will be something like this. And this L0 can, that's this particular value, but the L0 can decrease as we go uh, down. So, so these are what are called the flowed representations, spectrally flowed representations, and they have this property that they are unbounded from below. And um, uh, so that's uh, one of the very uh, uh, important uh, aspects of this. So J tilde uh, labels the uh, 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 the uh, representations of SL2R in terms of the tilde modes. So I consider like before something involving J tilde, the affine representations 
But now in terms of the J tildes, either the continuous or the discrete, I can consider any of these. Uh, and But when I interpret them in terms of my original L0 and J, J30, they will uh, they will have this uh, funny property. Um, uh, so uh, so that's uh, the uh, uh, statement about uh, uh, this. So as I said, this can be viewed as a. Uh, uh, so what have we achieved with this? And I'll just conclude after making. Uh, uh, these comments, um, uh, a couple of comments. Uh, so, uh, so this is, can be viewed as a trick to generate uh, new representations uh, of the affine algebra, which are not highest weight representations. Because in terms of the original mode generators, these are representations of the affine algebra, uh, which are not highest weight. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but they are primary. But they are nevertheless Verasoro primary. Uh, Mm -hmm. So even though you don't have an affine primary state, uh, you have a Virasoro primary, um, and that's because the, remember ln, if I write ln in terms of the tilde modes, and you have ln is equal to ln uh, from the expression I had written earlier, you can just invert it and you can see uh, that uh, ln will be given in terms of the ln tildes uh, in something like this. So for n greater than zero, so if um, j tilde n and ln tilde annihilate a state uh, for n greater than zero, uh, then ln also does. So it's a Virasoro primary, therefore, because you see for n greater than zero, this term doesn't contribute. ln is just some linear combination of ln tilde and jn tilde. But by construction, the tilde modes, the, the, the spectrally flowed representations are ones which are highest weight primaries of jn tilde uh, and uh, therefore ln tilde by the uh, Sugawara construction. And therefore, um, they are annihilated by both of them. So they are annihilated by ln also. So they are not primaries with respect to the affine generators, but they are primaries with respect to the Virasoro generators. Okay, so um, so that's uh, the this thing. So uh, uh, so we call these uh, states uh, spectrally flowed. Will denote the spectrally flowed states by c hat. J tilde W lambda and D plus W J tilde. So remember, J tilde is the label for the uh, tilde Casimir, uh, uh, and uh, that labels the uh, high, uh, highest weight states in terms of the tilde modes. Uh, and um, uh, and as I said, the J30 and LN will be the physical space-time generators, Verasoro uh, uh, generators. And uh, uh, so, uh, so let me just uh, write this last uh, this thing that uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the original modes, the highest weight state J tilde, M tilde uh, of the tilde modes. So these are highest weight states of the tilde modes, but in terms of the 
uh, in terms of the uh, the fact that they are annihilated by the tilde modes means that j plus now And uh, and uh, as I said, uh, the LNs will annihilate it, and uh, L zero will have another. L zero acting on Okay, sorry, I uh, got squished a bit, but um, uh, but I just wanted to uh, make this point that the, in terms of the, the fact that they are highest weight states of the original thing, namely the J tilde plus minus of uh, positive modes of the original of the tilde modes annihilated means in terms of the tilde modes, it means that J plus only N plus W modes will annihilate it. So there will be some number of positive modes which will not annihilate uh, this. And similarly, there will be some number of negative modes which will annihilate it, unlike uh, earlier. So things are a little shifted. Uh, so there are some negative modes here. Uh, if Let's say we take W to be a positive integer there'll be modes from n equals to one up to w minus one, which will annihilate it. So those will be negative modes in terms of the original j minuses. And similarly here, there will be n equals to minus one uh, up to uh, uh, um, uh, the negative modes, which are, uh, so n equals to zero to w minus one, these will, uh, continue to annihilate it, uh, the positive modes will annihilate it, uh, but there will be some which will not annihilate it because there are uh, the modes below W which will not annihilate this. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, so that's uh, the, uh, the, uh, the tricky thing about the spectrally flowed. This thing that now in terms of these modes, there are, it, it sort of shifts the set of modes uh, that uh, are annihilating it. And this is a very useful thing. And I'll, in the next lecture, I'll begin by uh, giving the physical meaning for this and what uh, it is and why it plays an important role in the string theory. Uh, in fact, I think a very critical role. Um, so let me stop there for now. And sorry for having gone uh, uh, over time. Uh, uh, thank you for a very clear and great lecture. So is there any question? Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. So yeah. can you do this for SU2? This uh, automorphism? Yes. So do you get something new from uh, after you do this for SU2? For SU2? Ah, yeah, good question. Uh, for SU2, uh, you don't get anything new because uh, you these kind of effectively just uh, rearrange the states in the representation. What you call highest weight state, state becomes another state, but it just kind of uh, reshuffles the state. Uh, the representations remain uh, essentially the same as representations. You're just relabeling the states. But uh, the thing that's different with the... Uh, with the uh, with the uh, non-compact, this thing is that because these are not finite-dimensional representations, 
the zero modes uh, don't act on uh, finite dimensional representations, but by these infinite dimensional representations. So now it's a genuine shift and you can't kind of reabsorb that shift by some uh, reshuffling of the labels. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, the uh, essential difference. Why in the non-compact CFTs, the, because the representations are infinite dimensional, even for the global part, uh, uh, this, these have a non-trivial effect. And uh, I will mention in my Monday seminar that uh, when we talk about the PSU 2,2 slash 4 for the ADS-5 case, there will be a similar effect coming there as well. Okay, thank you. So any other question? Uh, how, how could we understand this automorphism in the Sigma model? Yeah, I, I will, um, uh, I mean, I will describe what, uh, there are many ways to sort of say it, but one thing I will mention briefly next time is that uh, uh, there are new classical solutions in the Sigma model, uh, mm. which uh, correspond to the spectrally flowed sector and they are like winding modes. Um, they're effectively like winding modes. So you're kind of going to a, they're not quite topological sectors, though in some limit they will become topological sectors, but they're like new topological sectors that you have to add in the Sigma model. Uh, roughly speaking, that's a rough way to uh, think of it. Uh, and uh, uh, so in a way, the classical face face of the Sigma model itself tells you that you need to introduce these additional representations. Uh, I see. Uh, so, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, so are these, uh, so these spectral flow of these operators, is there any kind of relation to the renormalization flow that one considers from IR to UV for uh, any relation to the spectral flow of these operators? No, the, no, this, um, the, the name spectral flow actually comes from um, various other reasons. It has nothing to do with the renormalization group flow. Uh, it is closer to something like topological twisting, um, but it has, uh, um, uh, but the name spectral flow actually comes because there's an analogous operation that is performed in n equal to two superconformal field theories where you go from Ramon and never Schwartz representations to Ramon representations. Uh, Etc. So there are closely analogous things in this, but it has uh, nothing to do with uh, RG flow. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, then uh, let's close the session today, and uh, let's thank the speaker again.